Hello, I'm Dr. John McDougall, and I want to thank you all for being here today. This day gives me an opportunity to do what I like to do best, which is to help people. And I help people by sharing information that I've gathered over the last 25 years. And this information has been life-saving for people, life-changing. But I have to tell you, the things that you hear today are not all or nothing. In other words, I'm going to teach you the best I know, the best possible way to eat and live, the best in medical care. But you as individuals have to choose what's best for you. But it's only fair that I teach you ideal, isn't it? I mean, if you came to me and you said, Dr. McDougall, I don't want to get lung cancer, and uh, I don't want to get emphysema, how many cigarettes should I smoke? What should I tell you? So during this presentation, if you come to me and you say, look, I don't want to be fat anymore. I don't want to get breast cancer. I don't want to get heart disease or diabetes or rheumatoid arthritis. I want to be as healthy as possible. Then I have to give you the best answer possible. Now, what you do, again, is up to you. I'd like to share with you first about how this program began. This program started, I'd have to date it from when I met my wife, Mary, who you're going to meet later. We met in uh, Grand Rapids, Michigan, in an operating room. She was a surgical nurse, and I was a senior medical student. And I met her over the pinning of a hip. And I looked across that mask, and she had beautiful eyes, and I thought, wow, I've got to get a date with this girl. <laughs> well, I asked her, and she said no. I was going at that time to California to apply for internships in San Francisco and at L.A. County Hospital. And so I left, unfulfilled in my love, and went out to uh, San Francisco General and L.A. County to explore internships. Well, when I got back, I pursued her again. I said, Mary, you really ought to go out with me. I could be a lot of fun. Well, she did. <laughs> she did. She went out with me, and I, I guess that was enough because... She's been with me for uh, over 29 years. Well, I told her about my plans, about how I was going to go out to, to Los Angeles and work in this war zone at L.A. County Hospital or San Francisco General, and how I was going to work 30 hours on, and they were going to give me maybe 10 hours off to sleep. And she said, John, that sounds like a terrible way to spend our first year together. I said, well, Mary, what would you like to do? She said, well, let's go to someplace warm, you know, so maybe Florida. Maybe we could go to Hawaii. I said, okay, let's do that. I mean, what would one year do to me as far as my education if I just had a little bit of fun? And so we went to Hawaii, and I entered into what they call a surfing internship at Queens Medical Center. <laughs> we left in 1972 with two suitcases with the intention of staying for just one year. Well, I didn't learn how to surf. I learned to love the ocean. I learned to love Hawaii. And when I finished with that year of internship, I didn't want to come back to the mainland. And so I started looking for a job. And a job came up for me on the big island of Hawaii. And this experience changed my life forever. I became a plantation doctor. A plantation doctor takes care of people on a sugar plantation from birth to death. I had the opportunity to take care of 5,000 people mostly Filipinos, Chinese, Japanese, and Korean people. And this experience changed my life. The first thing it did is it taught me my limitations. You know, I went out into the practice of medicine with all kinds of ideals as to the kind of doctor I was going to be. I was going to save all these lives. I mean, after all, I knew what a real doctor did. I watched Ben Casey, Dr. <laughs> Kildare, and Marcus Welby, right? <laughs> well, I got into the practice of medicine, and what I found out very quickly is that I had some serious limitations. Very few of my patients did well. Now, some of them did, and I'll tell you about those patients in a few minutes, but most of my patients did terrible. And as hard as I tried, as many pills as I gave them, they still didn't do well. These were the people with chronic illnesses, chronic illnesses like chronic diabetes, chronic heart disease, chronic obesity, chronic indigestion, arthritis. But, you know, just the term chronic, it, it means they can't get better, doesn't it? Well, it made me really question my education, to say the least. Maybe I missed something by not taking one of those high-powered internships at L.A. County or San Francisco General, and instead taking a surfing internship. Well, the second thing that I learned from my patients was I learned about good eating. I was taking care of first, second, third, and fourth generation Filipinos, Japanese, Chinese, and Koreans. Now, first generation, they learned a diet of rice and vegetables. 
Now, what you learn early in life, you keep the rest of your life. And so they moved from their native lands to Hawaii, and they started a new life. They started a family. And uh, their family, however, learned new things. Their children learned a little bit more about the Western diet. The grandkids became very familiar with the Western diet. And what I had is I had this natural experiment where my first-generation patients lived primarily on rice and vegetables, they didn't drink milk. Why not? Because if they did, they got diarrhea, stomach cramp, cramps, and gas because of lactose intolerance. And meat, very rare. I mean, they had meat if the chicken lost the cockfight on Saturday. But otherwise, it was rice and vegetables. But their kids, of course, you know, they were influenced by the fast food restaurants, and they became more westernized in their diet. What I saw is that my patients who ate, quote, the worst diet based on what I had learned, the basic four food groups where you have to have something from the milk group, something from the meat group, something with the vegetable group, and the fruit group. My patients who skipped the first two groups, essentially, were my healthiest and trimmest patients. And the people, their children and grandchildren, who started to eat a well-balanced diet got fatter and sicker. So I had to reassess what I understood as a healthy diet. Now, the third thing that my patients taught me was that the excuse that I was taught to give you for why you were sick was invalid. I was taught by my teachers to tell you the reason you're sick is because you have bad ancestors. Why do I have high blood pressure, you ask? Well, it runs in your family. Well, why did I get breast cancer? Well, didn't Aunt Millie have breast cancer? And why did I have a heart attack? Well, your father had a heart attack. It runs in the family. But I had a problem. My first-generation patients had none of these diseases, and when I asked them about their parents and grandparents, they never had any of these problems either. It only started running in the family after people started eating the rich Western diet. Yeah. Now, I stayed for three years on the Big Island, and uh, after three years, we decided to move back so that I could get a better education. Not as far as back to the mainland, but back to Oahu. And things had changed in the three years that I was gone. At the University of Hawaii, they'd set up a medical residency, a medical surgery program, and they'd invited the best professors from the United States to come and man this program. And so I was about to enter a program where they had a macho training situation, where you work 30 hours on, they give you 10 hours off to sleep. But it was so important to me to get this education because I wanted to help people so badly, and I wasn't helping them. And so I was willing to give up almost anything. And so Mary and I moved from the Big Island with our container and a half full of furniture. And I took a cut in pay from $57,000 a year to $12,000 a year, but it didn't matter. We took our two children and we moved back to Oahu so that I could get an education. And I'll tell you, I went in with a good attitude into this training program back on Oahu at the University of Hawaii. I was going to learn how to be a good doctor. And so I listened to the professors. I listened to them, and I watched them, and I waited for the miracles, and I, I wanted to see my patients get well. But they did no better than I did. And after three months of watching this, I had to come to the conclusion that it wasn't my problem. The system doesn't work. And I'm going to share with you in a few minutes why the system doesn't work. From that point on, my loyalties changed. And I decided that what I was going to do was pursue what I, what I had observed in my years on the Big Island as a plantation doctor. I decided that I was going to see if other doctors had observed that patients stayed healthy if they ate a diet of rice and vegetables. And so I went to the library. I was very fortunate. At uh, Queens Medical Center, they had the Hawaii State Medical Library. And so I went to the library, and I looked up research, and I found that tens of thousands of doctors had made the same observations. Now, I have to tell you, these research papers in these journals, they sat on the library shelves collecting dust for a very obvious reason. They were worthless. Oh, excuse me. They weren't profitable. That was the problem. <laughs> They, they had value to me, but not to the usual medical business, at least the way it, it was run then and is run now. But I, I became passionately interested in this. And so I would spend every bit of my free time. And not only did I learn that you could prevent illnesses, 
But I learned from these doctors that had written in the scientific literature that once you stop doing the things that make people sick, they get well. The body heals. And that was so exciting because I really wanted to help people get well. And so seldom did I do it by the principles that I was taught. Now, I went back to my education with these new thoughts about uh, good diet and lifestyle and how important it was. And I tried to share them with, with lots of people. But I quickly found out that I was out of place. I was out of step with the medical business. And I was severely reprimanded when I started talking about the importance of diet. Now, you have to remember, this was uh, 1976 to 1978. And so I would have experiences like one day I went in to see a patient. He just had his second heart attack. His wife was there. I did my duty, which was a history and physical examination. When I finished my history and physical examination, I said to the man and his wife, I said, you've had two heart attacks. You've got one artery left. What are you going to do for making this woman a widow and your five kids fatherless? What are you going to do? He said, there's nothing I can do. He said, I, I, I exercise. I don't smoke. I follow the same di diet the dietician taught me after my first heart attack. There's nothing I can do. Well, I told him, you ought to hear about the things that I've been learning. And so I started to tell him all about heart disease and how it's uh, caused by eating a high-fat, high-cholesterol diet, things people know about now. But back in 1976 to 1978, these were considered uh, unorthodox or maybe even quackery. But they listened because they needed some kind of hope. And I left the room after about a two-hour discussion feeling so good about myself because I'd shared this and I know I'd really help somebody. And I felt good for about two hours until my chief of medicine got a hold of me. And he called me in and he said to me, John, you better get down to some serious medicine and stop this nonsense about food. And he was serious. Now, what had happened was the real doctor, I was just the resident, the attending doctor had come in and the patients had told the attending doctor about this wonderful treatment with good diet. And the attending doctor said, it can't be true. I know nothing about it. How could it be true? <laughs> and he, of course, went and told my boss, and I was in big trouble. And this was one of many similar experiences that I had. But I bit my tongue, I have to admit, and I survived, and I finished my residency program, and I became a board-certified intern internist, which, by the way, only about half of the internists in this country are. And so what that tells you is I know everything those other guys know. On my day of graduation, I had a very important talk with my chief of medicine. He brought me in to his office for our last father-to-son discussion. He said to me, John, he said, I think you're a good doctor, and I really like your family, but I'm afraid you're going to starve to death with all your crazy ideas about food. He said, all you're going to do is collect a bunch of bums and hippies. Now, you have to remember, this is 1978, when the radical fringe ate brown rice and brown bread. Well, I thought about it for a few minutes, and then I said to him, you know, if that's what I have to do, that's what I have to do, because you have to understand, I've been out in practice. I'm not like your, your, your regular resident that hasn't had the experience. I was out there for three years. I know what it's all about. And I can't put people on medication that I know will do them more harm than good. Now, I have to tell you right now, there are lots of wonderful medicines, lots of miraculous ones, but an awful lot of what I was asked to prescribe, the scientific literature said that it did not work and did more harm than good. And that's what I was referring to. And I also said that I am not going to send my patients off to surgery that I know will do them more harm than good. Again, there's lots of miraculous surgeries that are life-saving, just do wonderful things for people, but a lot of what I was asked to do for my patients, I had to do just because everybody else was. And I said, I'm not going to do that. And then I said something to him that really became the hallmark of my practice. I said, I don't believe it's going to be bums and hippies that I collect in my practice. I said, I believe it's going to be successful people. It's going to be people who have worked hard to get a good life. They've gotten a good education. They've built businesses. They've developed good family and personal relationships. These people just really enjoy their lives. And they're going to stop along the way and they're going to say to themselves, 
Look at me. I'm such a big success. How come I'm so fat? <laughs> how come I got to take all these pills all the time? And how come I risk losing everything in a moment from a tragedy like a, a heart attack or breast cancer? How come I have my arms around everything that's important to me except for my health? Now, without my health, I've got nothing. These successful people will ask that question. And I will be there, I told my chief of medicine. I will be there. And I will give them a logical set of rules. And they'll look at them. And they'll say, you're sure that makes sense. And they'll look at the scientific data behind it. And they'll say, it's solidly backed by scientific data. And then they'll say to themselves, this will take effort. But a minuscule amount of effort compared to what it took me to, to build my business or get my education or to have my family. And without my health, I've got nothing. They'll realize that. And that has been my practice over the last 26 years. It's been a practice of successful people. Now, I don't mean everybody owns a bank or uh, 100 acres on the coast, but in one way or another, the only people I've been able to, to help are people that care about themselves, who enjoy life, who really want it all. Well, I graduated, and I set up one of the most successful practices that Oahu has ever seen. I developed a practice where I would see 8, 9, 10, 12 new patients a day. They'd hear about me on radio, in the print media, on television, and they'd ask themselves, does he really mean I have to change my diet? So they'd come in, they'd pay their $100, and they'd sit across the desk from me, and I'd listen to their story, and they'd get all done, and I'd say, yep, you got to do this. And they'd leave and <laughs> never come back. <laughs> Most of them never came back. Can you believe that? <laughs> I used to think I wasted their money and their time and my time, but that wasn't the truth. That was just one of, one of the steps in their education. Many of these people have really come around since those days. But then some people would come to see me, and they'd listen to me very carefully, and they'd do what I suggested, just a small percentage. And they'd come back the next week, and I'd take them off some of their medication. And then they'd come back the next week, and I'd take them off the rest of their medication. Then they'd come back the next week, and I'd, they'd always have the same conversation with me. They'd say, I'm not sick anymore. I'm not taking any pills anymore. Why should I come and see you anymore? <laughs> so I lost those patients. It's just a darn good thing I saw so many new patients. It really got such, to be such a, uh, an interesting problem that Mary and I, every month, would have a potluck dinner at a yacht club or a community center so that we could see our old patients. Well, we did some cooking classes in the uh, late 70s, early 80s. And out of those cooking classes became a book that became a New York Times national bestseller, The McDougal Plan. Gave me a little bit of freedom, a little uh, financial freedom. Of course, I didn't have kids in college then. And uh, it um, gave me a chance to reassess what I wanted to do in life. At that time, I'd been on some very big television shows. I'd been on uh, Larry King and played uh, as the best of Larry King on his radio show. I'd been on CNN News six times that year. I'd uh, been on uh, Our Magazine, you know, and really literally hundreds of radio and television shows across the country. And I said, heck, I'm just going to be a, a media doctor. And so I retired in 1985. And I have to tell you, it was one of the most unproductive years that I spent, and probably one of the most miserable years that Mary spent with me around the house all the time. <laughs> but I learned some things about myself. One thing I learned was how important patients are for me. After being out of practice for three or four months, I'd go on radio and television shows, and I'd say, well, this is what happened to my patients, and it didn't come through honestly because I didn't have any patients. And the whole meaning of my, my practice, of, of, of my... My message, it was lost because I didn't have people that I could directly touch and, and be in contact with and, and feel so good about helping. And so about that time, the folks from St. Helena Hospital in the Napa Valley came to see me and asked me if I'd consider running a program 
at their hospital. And I went up and took a look at the hospital. As I walked through the hospital, they would tell me such things as, how do you like, live, how do you like visiting paradise? And the first couple of people I, I, I asked them, do you know where I live? <laughs> right off Kailua Beach. But it really was a beautiful setting. They uh, showed me the uh, track that people got to exercise on, the nice swimming pool where they got to exercise, the beautiful rooms looking over the Napa Valley, formal dining room. And then they took me into the education room, and that's where they closed the deal. They said, John, this is where you get to teach people, and you can lock them up for as long as you like. I mean, this just it sounded just too good to be true because, you see, I, I was helping so few people in an outpatient setting. Now, that's changed from the 70s and the early 80s because all of society has become more sophisticated in terms of diet. And so it's much easier to educate people and to get them to make these kinds of changes. But back then, it was very difficult. Yes, you can keep them here for as long as you like, and the nearest McDonald's is 20 miles by foot. <laughs> Well, we um, have stayed at St. Helena Hospital all these years and have really enjoyed it. I'd like to take a moment and tell you about another aspect of the story. It's a very personal aspect, but, but first I need to have you focus on one thing, and that is the reason I practice medicine the way I do is because it works. And the way I was taught, in most cases, it doesn't work. And I like to help people, just like other doctors. That's how I get my enjoyment. So keep focused on that. That's why I do this, for selfish reasons, because I want to feel good about myself. The personal side of this has to do with my own health. And it explains to you why I've earned the right to talk about good nutrition and bad nutrition. I was raised in a suburb, a suburb of Detroit in a lower middle class family. My mother thought good nutrition was Wonder Bread, lots of meat, lots of milk, and canned green vegetables. And our family was sick as a result. I remember as a young child, I had terrible stomach cramps, and I'd be embarrassed to tell you the stories of the constipation I suffered. At seven, I lost my tonsils like any good milk-drinking child. You know, those tonsils are there to fight off those dairy proteins. Well, mine were really busy, and they got really large, and the doctor took them really out. As a, um, <clears throat> as a young boy, I was sick quite a bit. I had uh, a lot of flus, coughs, colds, stomach problems, as I mentioned. And uh, I couldn't understand it because I'd look at my dog and cat and I'd say, how come my dog and cat are never sick and I'm always sick? Well, the answer was simple. Is I was feeding my dog and cat what dogs and cats are supposed to eat. In fact, if I would have fed my dog and cat some of the things that I was eating, cakes, candy, cookies, they'd, they'd arrest me. As a teenager, I was trim, a little pimply, a bit sluggish. And uh, as a teenager, we became a little more successful as a family. My dad worked very hard, and so we became middle class, maybe upper middle class, and so we could afford a little fancier rich foods. For example, I could have eggs every morning for breakfast and sausage. Uh, for lunch, ring bologna sandwiches. For dinner, we'd have steaks on the grill three, four times a week. If I got hungry in the evening, I'd go over to Corbino's and get a, a pizza at night. On Sunday, it was uh, fried chicken and ham. You know, typical American foods I enjoyed ate with enthusiasm, and then I went off to college. And to get rich food was just a matter of walking through the cafeteria line and just piling your plate up, pork chops, uh, uh, bacon, eggs. You know, you remember those days. I was at no risk of becoming calorie, cholesterol, calcium, fat, or protein deficient. <laughs> well, something happened to me about three months into my education that changed my life forever. One morning, I got up confused, but I had to go to class, and the reason I had to go to class is because one of my mentors told me that if you go to class, John, you're going to pass, and he was right. I was a straight D-plus student, and so I got up out of bed, even though I didn't feel well, and I walked to English class, and I laid down on my desk and slept for the hour of English class. Then I got up, and I walked back to my dorm, and I was so confused by then that I walked out in the street, and I got hit by two cars. Didn't hurt the cars, didn't hurt myself. That just gives you some idea about how badly things were going for me. I got back to my dorm, and I thought, if I just lay down and go to sleep, maybe I'll wake up and this bad dream will be gone. Well, I woke up a couple hours later, and I had a real problem. I had to get to algebra, and the entire left side of my body didn't work. 
So how was I going to get to algebra? Well, I asked my dorm mates. I said, would you give me a ride to algebra? And they said, oh, sure. Well, they played a trick on me, and they took me to the health center instead. After deciding that I wasn't trying to get out of a test, they put me in isolation overnight, and then they sent me to Grace Hospital in Detroit for an evaluation. And they did skull x-rays. They did a spinal tap. They did all the tests they could possibly do, and then they finally did an angiogram on me. Now, these days, angiograms are done through the leg. But back then, they did them through the neck. And I want to tell you, that was an experience I will never forget. But what they found was that I had a stroke like an old person. Because I wasn't famous, you didn't read about it in the newspaper. But if I was a, if I was a football player or basketball player who had a heart attack or stroke as a teenager, it would, it would reach national headlines. And about 1,000 teenagers a year have heart attacks or strokes. Now, this was a life-changing experience for many reasons. One thing it did for me is it taught me about the medical business. You see, before this happened, in my family, doctors were considered next to God. And I wasn't that kind of material. I was just a regular old person. And so I had no aspiration of being a doctor. But here I was put in a setting where I got to meet lots of doctors, very good doctors. As a matter of fact, the best doctors from Detroit, all over the area, came to see me. Why? I was a curiosity. And so they'd come into my room, and they would examine me, ask me some questions, and then we'd have the same conversation. I would say, what's wrong with me? What are you going to do for me? And when am I going to go home? And every one of them did the same thing. They'd... I said, heck, I can do that. <laughs> So I left against medical advice, and I went straight back to school, and I became a straight A student. After all, I almost lost my life. And so I had to really reassess things. But I didn't stop eating the rich food. I got into medical school, and when you're in medical school, they reward you for scut work, which is you know, shaving people, putting in catheters, drawing blood, working all night long. They reward you with free food. And so I just ate and ate and ate until I got to the point where my mother called me fat. Yeah. <laughs> you know you're in trouble when that lovely lady calls you fat. I was, um, I was uh, about 228 pounds. I weigh 173 now. So I was, I was, I thought I was cute, but I was <laughs> certainly uh, generous in size. It didn't stop there. I went on to my internship and continued to eat the rich food. And the stomach pains got even worse, and I'd come home at night and lay on the couch in the fetal position for a couple hours. And Mary finally said to me, John, you, you've got to get some help. You can't go on like this. I want you to ask a doctor tomorrow, what's wrong with you? Unfortunately, I was on the surgical service. So you can imagine where I spent the afternoon. After exploring my abdomen and finding nothing wrong, they took out my appendix for good measure, of course, because they were in there. They sewed me up, and it was a mystery to them. But nobody asked me about the three hot dogs with hamburger relish I had every night after I came home from work. I would have been a one-inch obituary in the Honolulu Advertiser. 32-year-old doctor drops dead of a heart attack, except for the fact that my patients taught me the path to good health through good nutrition. And they saved my life. And that's why I'm here today. I would like to uh, share with you some of the principles that I teach people at St. Lena Hospital and across the country. First thing I want to share with you is uh, an observation that you can make as you go out on the streets. I was at a restaurant recently, and a lady came up to me with a camera, said, I'd like to take your picture, just $10. And I said, no, thank you. My family does not want their picture taken, but I would like you to take a picture of this family on my left. And so she went and took the picture, brought it back to me, and I gave her the $10. And I said, now I would like you to take a picture of the family sitting at the table on my right. And so she took the next picture. The difference in these two families is obvious. What happened between the first and second generation and the third and fourth generation? Did they change their genes, their heredity? Of course not. What happened is these people started eating less rice, less vegetables, more meat, more dairy products, more processed food. 
Now, this observation can be made by you. All you have to do is look around the world. And what you will find is that people who live in parts of the world where they eat plant-based diets, diets based on rice, beans, millet, corn, pastas, these people are trim and healthy. For example, in Africa, in the Middle East, and in the Far East. And when these people move to the United States or Western Europe and eat less pasta, less rice, more meat, more dairy, they lose their immunity to obesity and sickness. Heart disease becomes common, breast cancer, prostate cancer, colon cancer. Here's an inter interesting observation. In Africa, the first case of rheumatoid arthritis was described in 1957. The first case of lupus was described in 1960. Today in the United States, the highest incidence of both of these diseases among the African Americans. So what happened in 40 years? It was the change in diet. You don't have to be confused. There are people teaching you about high-protein diets, high-fat diets, low-carbohydrate diets, all kinds of different diets. You can make this simple observation, and you will understand the truth. The uh, Surgeon General of the United States issued a report that was a landmark report in 1988. He took 350 scientists, had them research the scientific literature, and they came back to the conclusion that the rich American diet was the biggest killer in this country, killed over a million people. And then he told us that of the 10 leading causes of death, five of them are due to our diet. These are cancer, heart disease, strokes, diabetes, and other forms of atherosclerosis. Now, if you include other diseases that are due to the way we live, for example, if you include a disease that is caused by something that passes under our eyes and right through our lips, and that's alcohol, you have three or four of the other leading causes of death, which are cirrhosis of the liver, suicide, which can be divided into suicide and homicide, and accidents. What the Surgeon General is telling you and I is something very important, and that is that the cause of eight or nine of the ten leading causes of pre premature death are within our control. We have the potential to do something. Now, I like that, and I know you do too. You want to be in control. You don't want to be a helpless victim like I used to be. I was a helpless victim when I believed that disease was caused by heredity, the wrath of God, bad luck, all which may be true, but I cannot control these things. I want to believe in a set of values that allows me to change my future. And believing that diet and lifestyle are the cause of disease gives me the potential to make a difference for myself. And the potential is great. I want to point out to you, of the 2.1 million people who died in 1987, three quarters of them died as a consequence of what they ate or drank. Now, I mentioned to you a few minutes ago that I didn't help very many people when I was a practicing plantation doctor. But I have to qualify that. I have to tell you there was a group of people that I helped a lot, and other doctors helped too. These are people who suffer from acute illnesses. Acute illnesses are things like lacerations or broken bones or infections. Chronic illnesses are things that uh, last a long time. In fact, they go on and on and on, and people just stay the same or get worse. There are things like chronic obesity, chronic indigestion, chronic constipation, heart disease, arthritis. That's what most people suffer from is chronic diseases. Now, to understand why we can't help chronic disease, I have to explain to you why we can help acute illnesses. We can help acute illnesses because acute illnesses are due to single injuries to the body. For example, the cut. The doctor goes in, sews it up, the wound heals straighter and faster. Or the broken bone, the doctor straightens out the bone, it heals straighter and faster. Or the infection, the doctor lances the abscess, gives an antibiotic that tips the balance in favor of the patient, and the patient does better. Why? Because it was a single injury to the body, and the intervention made a difference. Chronic illnesses, however, are due to repeated injuries to the body. For example, what if I had a nervous habit, and every day I scratch myself for 10 minutes, and I develop a sore on my hand, I could put the most expensive antibiotic that Upjohn Company 
makes on that sore, and I would continue to have a sore until I did what? Uh, stop the repeated injury, right? Sure. I used to have a terrible disease. I, I was a, a respiratory cripple. I was dying. This was uh, in my late teens and early 20s. I would cough. I'd wheeze. If you've ever been to Hawaii, there's a, there's a hill that I'll never forget. It's from Hanama Bay up to the parking lot. I couldn't walk. As a young man, I couldn't walk from that bay up to that parking lot without stopping to catch my breath twice. I was dying. I went to the doctor for help. And the doctor gave me acute care solutions. He gave me cough syrup, wheezing pills, antibiotics when things got really bad. He would do spironograms and chest x-rays on me, treated me like I had an acute illness. And I could have died from my problem except for the fact that I got strength and wisdom. And on October 20th, 1972, I stopped injuring myself 40 times a day with Marlboro cigarettes. Yeah. And a week later, I no longer coughed or wheezed. Now, I want to tell you, I can run up that hill from that bay to that parking lot without worrying about my breath. Other parts might get tired, but I don't worry about my breath. <laughs> so the solution to chronic disease is to identify the repeated injury and stop that behavior and allow the healing processes to catch up. That's all there is to it. So what is the source of repeated injury for most people in our society? It's four or more feasts a day is what it is. I remember when I was growing up, I started every morning with Easter. I went on to Thanksgiving and Christmas for lunch and dinner. And every night after dinner, it was a birthday party. Yeah. That's the problem. You know, throughout history, most people lived on diets based on starches. For example, in Western Europe, it was uh, breads. And in uh, Southern Europe, it was pasta. And in the Far East, it was rice. And in the Polynesian countries, it was potatoes and breadfruit. And what they would do is, is occasionally people would have holidays. They'd have special occasions, festivals, they called them. And what they would do is unordinary things. They would uh, dance in the street, take the day off work, and eat unusual food, like they would kill a pig and roast it over a, a uh, barbecue, uh, over a fire. Or they'd take a couple of chickens and throw it in the pot of vegetable stew. Now, for the common person, most people, they could only do that once in a while. But there were people in every society who were rich. And, and these people would go to the party and they'd say, Oh, I'm having so much fun. I, I, I can do this. I can do this more often, can't I? Sure, I'm rich. And so they would walk up the hill to the castle and they would party all day long. They would have a feast for breakfast, lunch, and dinner seven days a week. And do you remember what these aristocrats and kings and queens looked like? Like Americans. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. I can go out on any street in America, and within four minutes, I can cast you a play for King Henry VIII. <laughs> Hands down. You know, back then, it was a little different. They had uh, rich food served on silver platters. Today, we have it between styrofoam leaves, but it's the same stuff. <laughs> And we even call it by names that, uh, that reflect the richness. We call it Burger King, Dairy Queen, Imperial Margarine. You know, nobody's trying to, to disguise this. So the solution to the problem is to make feasts special again. That's all. And some people have been feasting so long and have got themselves into so much trouble, they're going to have to skip a few holidays. Let me mention one of the, the, the biggest holidays of the year. In fact, it's the biggest food feast of the year, and that's Thanksgiving. Think about Thanksgiving for a minute. Thanksgiving, the biggest food feast of the year, is the highest vegetable, lowest fat meal that 99.9% .9 of Americans eat. And after this biggest food feast of the year, they go on to bigger food feasts for the rest of the year. Why? Why would you expect anything different than to have people be in trouble to reflect the diseases of royalty of kings and queens? Chronic disease. I mean, this is really a big deal, chronic disease. In uh, our country, 90 million people suffer from chronic disease. That's one-third of the population in this country suffers from chronic disease. 32 million people are suffering from limitations as, to, as a result of their chronic disease. And 9.2 million people are disabled. And three-quarters of the health care dollars are spent on chronic disease. I mean, the person who figures out how to solve chronic disease could be very influential 
and very rich. We figured it out. But the problem is to get people to do it. And that's where we put our efforts, and that's where the changes take place. The diet that best supports health. I want to define it for you right now. It's a starch-based meal plan. It's based around comfort foods, things that you love, like rice, corn, pasta, potatoes, beans, squashes, with the addition of fruits and vegetables. Now, do not, do not think this is a diet of green and yellow vegetables. There are many people out there that are, that are hearing about the importance of vegetables, and so they start to focus their diet on broccoli, cauliflower, pea pods, and carrots. And after two days, they say, I can't do this. I'm starving. I couldn't do it either. But what you can do is live off a starch-based diet, which has plenty of calories, all the proteins, vitamins, minerals that you need, a starch-based meal plan. And fruits and vegetables are side dishes. They're additions. They add color, flavor, texture, aroma. When I was growing up, it was mashed potatoes for me. That's what I love. I think it's the reason I'm alive today, because of mashed potatoes. I'd have a big plate of mashed potatoes. I'd have corn and peas with it and a brown gravy. Of course, back then, the brown gravy was made from a beef stock. Nowadays, it's made from healthy ingredients. And it's still one of my, my favorite meals. And there's got to be some things in your past that you really like, comfort foods, we call them, that you can focus on and say, you know, not only can I eat that, but I love to eat that. And as we go through our discussion, you'll understand just how important it is for you to eat these kinds of foods and how they make you trim and make you healthy and allow you to eat as much as you want and become trimmer and healthier with every bite. Now, things have changed over the years. I was raised with the idea of the basic four food groups, just like most of you. This allowed you to eat anything and everything that could fit between your lips. Now, science has had to change things. They've had to change things, and policymakers have had to follow because of the evidence, the research. And so what we have now is we have the, the food pyramid, which tells us that the base of our diet should be starch, and then we should have fruits and vegetables, and then meat and dairy, and at the top of the pyramid, we're allowed to eat anything we want, cookies, candy, oils, whatever we want. Well, that's a compromise, folks. That's a compromise based upon the policymakers' own diet, their considerations for industry, and also their belief that that's too much to ask of you to eat a really healthy diet. Well, the truth of the matter is, if you want to understand what a really healthy diet is, because I believe they understand it just based on their food pyramid, all you have to do is take the top of the pyramid and lop it off, and you have what I call the McDougal trapezoid, <laughs> which is a starch-based diet with the addition of fruits and vegetables. That's where the truth is. The compromise is in that part we lopped off and threw away. Now, you're here, I assume, because you've had enough. And it happens to all of us, like for me, with my cigarette smoking. I'd had enough. I didn't want to be that person anymore. I didn't want to burn holes in my clothes. I didn't want to stink terrible, not be able to walk up hills. I didn't want to be that person. I had had enough. And so I knew what I had to do. I had to quit that habit. I can't tell you it was easy. It wasn't. And I can't tell you that I succeeded the first time I tried, because I didn't. But the, the desire to be a happier and healthy person was so strong that I kept at it until I finally did. And so people who eat the rich American diet, who have problems of being overweight, who have uh, problems of taking medications and feeling, feeling terrible, they get to the point where they say, I cannot go on like this anymore. I've had enough. What do I do? And that's what Mary and I have an opportunity to share with you, is what you do. And then that day comes, you say, I'm tired of eating grease, unhealthy foods. I want my health back. This is what I used to do. This is who I used to be. And this is what I'm going to do and the person I'm going to be. And you make that change. And the results are dramatic. They're every bit as dramatic as quitting tobacco or quitting alcohol or starting an exercise program. And you know, it's something you've got to do anyways. You have to eat. You might as well learn what the right things are and start consuming them today. 
The problem's obvious. You're beginning to become armed with the information. And it's very simple. The problem is that we eat feast foods like kings and queens. So we end up looking like kings and queens and suffering their diseases. So what we want to do is we want to change to a plant-based meal plan and keep feasts for special. Now, I have to tell you, this is not an all-or-nothing approach. This is not a prison. This is a set of rules that sets you free so that you can pick the days you're well and pick the days you want to be sick. It's up to you. <laughs> and you deserve that. That's what my goal is, is to give everybody the opportunity to have the health and appearance that they deserve. And with this information, you're going to have it. And I hope you rejoice in all that good health and the wonder that we have for this lifetime. Thank you.